I give it a star. Yeah. Okay. So, good morning, everybody. I want first to welcome those people who are uh, looking at us online. So very much welcome to this uh, meeting and those who did the walk to come here early in the morning. Very much welcome. Uh, this is uh, rather looking like a kind of family meeting. So we uh, can have a little bit more informal interaction, uh, but that can only contribute to the quality. And as I always say, it's not the quantity, but the quality that counts. And I'm sure that we will have a very fruitful interaction. Thanks for being here with us. Uh, the expert panel on effective ways of investing in health, as you know, during the last six years, has produced, I think, 19 opinions, if we count it, mm -hmm. on different topics. So this is number 19. And uh, we are very happy that we uh, finish our second cycle, because we work in cycles of three years, with a very important topic, which is uh, the health uh, promotion and health promoting health systems. Um, I suggest that for today we approach it this way, that first of all, we will listen to the introduction and it is our rapporteur, Professor Margaret Berry uh, from Galway, that is going uh, to lead us through this document. And the aim then of the exercise is that we have as much as possible feedback and comments from your sides on the draft opinion that, by the way, was already on, the, on our website, in order that we, uh, we have your ideas and that we can see uh, then how we can improve, correct, uh, optimize our document. Our document that has the ambition to serve in preparation of policy meeting at different levels, that level of the Commission, the Parliament, but also the member states and the regions. Uh, the hearing will be web streamed. Whenever you intervene, please present yourself shortly so that not only for the report, but also for those who are following uh, abroad, uh, they can hear and see who you are. Um, so if you agree with this uh, procedure, then I uh, <coughs> suggest that we listen to Professor Margaret Berry, uh, who will lead us through the opinion document. Is that okay for you? So, Margaret, you've got the floor. Thank you very much, and good morning, everybody, and thank you all for joining us. Um, as Jan said, here is a picture of the expert panel. I actually think there are one or two people missing on this photograph, but anyway, that's uh, the group of us who were involved in the second stage of the panel, uh, and many of those members contributed to the production of this opinion. Uh, Professor Jan de Masner was the chair, I was the rapporteur. You can see all the names listed here, members of the panel who contributed. And I also want to acknowledge the uh, contribution of external experts, uh, Professor Timo Stahl from Finland and Dr. Selina Rajan from the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine, who also contributed. So what I want to do in this presentation is to try and give you an, an overview and a condensation, if you like, of what's in the report and the full report is online and you can read that. So it will give you really the essence of what's in the document. So I'll take you through it. So first of all, starting with the, the mandate that we got, what we were asked to do and the terms of reference for that. So firstly, we were asked to explore what are the mechanisms for strengthening the implementation of health promotion within health systems. So looking at how health systems can more effectively in incorporate health promotion and what policies in place need to be, particularly around health in all policies, what, 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 you know, what needs to be in place to make that a reality. Um, as public health and primary health care are operating in a more integrated way to look at how this joint approach could contribute to greater integration and implementation of health promotion uh, from the point of view of improving health literacy, uh, its functioning within primary care and also linked to social care. And the final point was to uh, look at what are the success factors for further integration from a conceptual an organisational and a financing point of view. So we've tried to address these issues uh, in the course of the opinion. So starting, we thought it was important to just kind of um, start and look at, uh, have a clear understanding of health promotion, where it sits, uh, and also from a conceptual and policy framework point of view, I think that was important to lay that out and then look at how we can effectively integrate that. 
So the first thing to say is that health promotion, of course, is a critical component of modern health systems, and it is necessary for ensuring healthy lives and maximising health potential for all, ensuring that no one is left behind. So it's very much a universal approach. It reframes the challenge of improving population health and well-being since its emergence in the 1980s uh, because its focus is on how do we promote and protect good health at a population level. Therefore, it embraces a positive definition of health and uh, introduced a new and broader understanding of the factors that determine health and how those determinants can be addressed. So this brought, if you like, a shift in focus from primarily looking at the treatment and prevention of disease to now also look at how we can promote population health and well-being. So that was quite a significant uh, shift. The main conceptual framework we use is we go back to the Ottawa Charter for Health Promotion uh, introduced by WHO in 1986, which defined health promotion as the process of enabling people to increase control over and improve their own health. So keywords there, it's a process, it's about increasing control, and it's about health. Um, and the Ottawa Charter embraced a socio-ecological model of health, seeing a shift from a predominant biomedical model to looking at social ecology, where people live their lives. Um, and it provided a blueprint really for integrated action. So this was a paradigm change in thinking about health, and I've put health in bold, again, to emphasize that, um, and stated very clearly that health is more than the absence of disease. Um, and it really brought up the question, it asked the question, where is health created? Okay, and how can we promote uh, the greatest health gains for the greatest number of people? Right. So that's the, that's the orientation that it, it heralded. This requires a multidisciplinary knowledge and skills base that extends beyond the traditional healthcare approach. So it says we not only need to look at individual behaviours, but we also need to consider broader social and policy strategies across different sectors if we really are going to address this. So there, this is a, a graphic really representing the Ottawa Charter, a systems-based approach which looks not only at the level of the individual, but it looks at the individual in the context of their community, their environment, and the structural and policy factors that determine that. So that's why we talk about integrated action at each of the five uh, areas, developing personal skills, strengthening community action, reorienting our health services towards promotion and prevention, creating supportive environments for health, and ensuring we have public policy that promotes good health. So these are the five, and we need these to work together in a systems approach. That's the basic model that was put forward by um, the Ottawa Charter, underpinned by key principles. So the rationale, the reason why health promotion came around in the first place, I suppose that rationale is still, in fact, even more relevant uh, still today. We are seeing changing patterns of health, uh, and the continuation and emergence of new and complex health problems, non-communicable diseases, addressing those, in, uh, improving mental health, and also people living longer with multiple chronic conditions. So all of this presents quite a challenging uh, picture. Um, also very important, addressing the social determinants of health inequities. Health inequities have grown. In many cases, they have not reduced, despite the you know, improved um, kind of economic and social conditions in, in, in some countries, uh, and looking at how we can do that. And health promotion here, the, you know, the reason it, it came about was there was a recognition that in fact behavioural, social and environmental factors play a real part in shaping population health. They shape the environments people live in and they shape the decisions and choices people can make. So we talk here about addressing the causes of the causes. Uh, the other argument is that for the sustainability of our health systems, because you know we have rising demands for expensive clinical treatments and healthcare, we have to look at what can turn the tap off. You know we've got rising uh, NCDs, so we have to go back and say how can we invest in prevention and health promotion, keeping people healthy in the first place. So this should be part of the continuum. The economic argument is also clear that there's a strong case in terms of the efficiency and the equity in our health systems 
gains. If we invest in health promotion, the health gains that can follow from that. And there's quite a lot of work emerging looking at improving long-term population health in a cost-effective way is possible through uh, quality health promotion and primary prevention. The policy frameworks, um, be that at a global level or at a European level, we can see the political declaration on the prevention and control of NCDs, the WHO Global Action Plan on Mental Health. Both of these focus very much on cross-sectoral actions. This is Im embedded in all these policies. The Helsinki Statement on Health in All Policies, of course, was a key framework uh, in terms of Im implementing a health in all policies approach at a country level. And we have Health 2020, again, our European policy framework, very much endorsing a kind of a cross-government and a cross-society for health and well-being. So we see common prior uh, priorities and common recommendations for action, embracing a whole-of-government and a whole-of-society approach. And then, more recently, we have the uh, Sustainable Development Goals by the UN uh, uh, here, ensuring that all human beings can fulfil their potential in dignity and in equality in a healthy environment. So health promotion is key to that endeavour. Uh, we have specifically Goal 3, looks at ensuring healthy lives and promoting well-being for all across all ages, and particularly Target 3.4. Um, which again, it's interesting for the first time it explicitly references mental health, target 3.4, to promote mental health and wellbeing. And that was quite a significant um, inclusion uh, in this document. But when we look at the other, the other 16 SDGs, the majority of them in fact are important determinants of health, be that in terms of poverty, uh, uh, education, gender equality, a sustainable living environment. So these are the determinants. Um, and this is reflected in the Shanghai Declaration on Promoting Health. And again, uh, universal health coverage in terms of looking at universal health in a, in, in, in a, in a, in a comprehensive way. So, I mean, these, just to go back, these policy frameworks and the SDGs, they provide an important, I suppose, new impetus to re-engage to re and reinvest in, in that full spectrum of uh, health systems. So in terms of implementing health promotion, going from the frameworks to making it a reality, uh, successive EU health policies and strategies have endorsed the need to invest in health promotion. Uh, but progress is very variable across the EU uh, member states. Some countries have made a lot of progress, others less. Um, the focus, I could say, is primarily still on curative and clinical care, as countries are still struggling with the delivery of that in many cases. We do know that there are cost-effective and feasible health promotional interventions available and that have been shown to make a real difference in terms of improving population health, reducing risks for illness, improving health and well-being, health literacy and health equity. So there is an evidence base that, and that this works and that it's feasible to implement. However, there are still significant gaps in implementation. Uh, we see that in many countries there's a lack of political commitment and a lack of investment in developing health promotion systems and ensuring that there is sustainable financing mechanisms for this. Um, in many countries, there's a lack of infrastructure around health promotion. Whose responsibility is it? Who's going to do it? Who's going to make it happen? So the organisational and the workforce capacity is not developed in many cases. So that was the first part of the opinion where we laid out what is health promotion, where does it sit in, where does it come from. And then in the second part, we engaged in an exercise to say, well, look, what progress has achieved, like what barriers and what enablers are there in order to kind of advance uh, progress. In this, we drew on the existing literature because there has been quite a bit written in terms of progress on health promotion since the Ottawa Charter in 1986, so 25 years on, 30 years on, and we drew on some of those papers that had made a kind of a critical reflection on that. Also on papers that looked at some of the issues around policy change in population health and health promotion, how difficult it is to get this on the policy agenda and keep it there. 
So we drew on those uh, papers and also the work of the Joint Action Crodus Plus report, uh, which uh, recently did an overview of good practices, gaps and needs in health promotion and primary care across 21 EU countries. So that's kind of looking at what is the current state of play in relation to this. Most of these um, uh, documents and publications talk about the need for a long term strategic approach, that this, there isn't a quick fix on this. Okay, so we need a, a, a long term view uh, and we need, there needs to be also, it's quite clear, a focus on creating supportive environments for health um, and avoiding what's termed lifestyle drift, where we just look at individual behaviour change but do not address the environments that influence that. So that's coming out clearly. Um, and the other issue that comes out is that we need uh, sustainable resourcing and capacity development for health promotion. Because as we've seen in times of economic difficulty and austerity, this is the first area that will be cut in the budget. So how do we protect that? Okay, so in, as well as drawing on the literature among the panel, we had a kind of critical reflection and active discussion around this. And in terms of looking at the enablers for progress, we drew quite heavily on a position statement by the International Union for Health Promotion and Education on the system requirements for health promotion and primary prevention. They had outlined 10 system requirements, and so that informed some of our uh, thinking around this as well. So just looking here at barriers and enablers, this is what we came up with, putting all that together. So starting maybe with the barriers. The first is at a conceptual level. I suppose here that the, the concept of health promotion is often poorly understood. Everybody thinks it's a good idea, we're familiar with it, but what does it actually mean? And what does it actually mean when we translate it into practice? So there seems to be a block around that. And I, I, I know this, in fact, from uh, uh, teaching our, our own postgraduate students when they tell people, what are you doing? I'm doing a master's or a PhD in health promotion. Well, what is that? And I, I often say to them, you need to be able to explain that coherently <laughs> to anybody who asks. And it's something that people struggle with. So that, it, you know, that conceptual uh, clarity around what it is. Also, it lacks visibility, you know, in terms of the larger health system approach, that it's not uh, as high on the agenda. And it lacks public visibility as well. And also there are sometimes ethical issues around some of the health promotion strategies, be it in terms of like social marketing or very targeted behaviour change. People say, well, this is the nanny state intervening, telling people how to live their lives, what they can eat or cannot eat and what they should do. So there are kind of sometimes ethical arguments put forward as well, and these need to be addressed. Um, in terms of policy and political barriers, we looked at institutional norms and practices at a policy level. And of course, these are very much still dominated by, uh, you know, the treatment of disease. That's, you know, the immediacy of dealing with new uh, uh, and, and continuing health problems. So this is, the, this is first on the agenda. Uh, and so where, where does health promotion and prevention find a space in relation to that? Um, the medical model of health is still very dominant and so therefore bringing in a more social model of health, a socio-ecological model is quite, is, is quite difficult. We have of course very powerful competing vested interests, be that in terms of hostile industries, tobacco, uh, alcohol, uh, and where, where we're looking at bringing about real societal change in relation to that, so these ha and have deep pockets. Um, health promotion has a very broad scope. Um, and often there is a diffusion of responsibility. Uh, so it's a big landscape in terms of health promotion and who is responsible. And so that kind of, there's often seen as a lack of accountability because of that, and that's a barrier. Um, lack of institutional structures and processes, and this is important around structures, both in terms of policy, but also around delivery. Okay, so because if, even if you have this in the policy document, how is it going to translate into action on the ground? and who's going to do it. So these are the lack of implementation mechanisms <coughs> and of course the funding mechanisms. If there isn't investment in this, no matter how nice the policy documents look, if there isn't resourcing of this, it will not actually be translated uh, into action. So the incentives for that. So we look then to see, well, what if we, these are the barriers, these are some of the barriers, I'm sure you could think of others. Um, what are the kind of enablers that can address these? So we felt that in terms of the conceptual barriers, there is clearly a need for much more effective advocacy for health promotion. 
to clearly communicate its purpose, um, to raise its visibility at a policy and at public level. And if we can do that, if there's a greater understanding of this, and essentially you're creating a public demand for this, well, then you have a strong justification for policy implementation and for keeping it high on, on the health agenda. In terms of the policy and political requirements, high level political commitment is really essential. Uh, and be that at the level, <clears throat> for example, in some countries of having ministerial responsibility for health promotion. In my own country in Ireland, we have a minister for health promotion. So that person is responsible for arguing for the budget and for reporting. Uh, on results. So that's, that makes a difference if someone has that. Establishing institutional structures and processes that will support policy change. Uh, developing capacity and delivery mechanisms for actual implementation, how this is going to be rolled out at the, at the regional and local level. Um, developing workforce capacity. Looking at, we're saying that you, we require a multidisciplinary knowledge and skill base. Well, we have then developed that capacity and we have already in, in invested some work in this in terms of identifying core competencies for health promotion at the European level and also looking at it, there's an international accreditation system for this to try and in increase and uh, improve the kind of quality assurance around what goes under the headings of health promotion because it's not an umbrella term for everything. It is it actually has a defined uh, set of uh, competency skills. Um, the need to invest in health promotion research and evaluation because we need the research obviously around how this works, where it works, when, um, and also innovation around how we do that because we're often dealing with multi-level uh, strategies and approaches. And then the strong argument for sustainable financing, ensuring that there are, you know, that the, the, that the financing mechanisms are solid, that there's a commitment to it and that they are protected. So that is that is the the, the big challenge there. Um, so these are uh, you know and, and in relation to the financing, I suppose the, the I'll talk a little bit more about that in a moment. So they were the barriers and enablers. So after we had kind of gone through that critical reflection, we then said, well, let's look at some of the mechanisms uh, for strengthening. And this was the the final section of the report before we came to the recommendation. So how, you know, what are the mechanisms that we know are there and, can, and, and are being applied and can strengthen health promotion within health systems? So firstly, we looked at implementing a health in all policies approach, which is essentially about promoting coherent policy across sectors to enhance population health, well-being, and equity. And we can only do that when we work across sectors. It's not just within the health sector. And that's ensuring that there is capacity and competence within the health system to do this not just working within health, but talking across government departments and wider uh, community. Um, there's a need uh, for permanent structures that will enable sustained work, because this is the, the, the long-term investment. The, we need to have intersectoral committees at intergovernmental level, mm -hmm. and we need to ensure that the processes and mechanisms are systematic. That is really key. Um, and in the document, we, we, we uh, present on lessons from Finland in terms of implementing this in practice and what they have seen to, to, to be helpful. And also Wales and Australia, some examples included there. And what they're saying to us is this requires long-term commitment and vision at a political and policy level, but it also requires uh, permanent and systematic structures, processes, and tools. And some of those are being developed. So every country doesn't have to reinvent the wheel here, but they, you know, we, the structures have to be appropriate to, to the local context. Um, so that was, um, and there's obviously more detail on that in the opinion. And these were some of the key components which, uh, based on Timo Stahl's work, that were identified. Very important is monitoring, evaluating and reporting because we have to constantly look and see is this working uh, where. Framing planned action, having supportive organisational structures, um, ensuring that the needs and priorities are initially identified. And they look at kind of consultative mechanisms at a country level around this. So it's, you know, a really engaging uh, wider community and uh, capacity building. Okay. <clears throat> Next, we went on to look at health promoting health services because when we looked at uh, the papers that had reported on progress since Ottawa, this was the area where the most probably least progress had taken place. 
uh, our health systems have n have not really reoriented to integrate promotion health promotion in the way that maybe was intended or could have happened and I know this was of particular interest in terms of the mandate um, so we looked here at some of initiatives that have been successful in this space so for example the WHO health promoting hospitals initiative um, which is an international network of health promoting hospitals and we looked at well maybe what made this kind of successful and some of it was the fact that yes there was an international network that was active there were coordinators in countries there were standards set there was monitoring and evaluation and there were indicators you know and that helps to make it structured you know and you can monitor and see what's going on likewise the ba baby friendly hospitals initiative follows a similar mm -hmm. sort of so maybe you know looking at that maybe looking at the models there in terms of what what contributed to making that successful we also looked at the area of health promotion services for older people where there is a huge scope i think here for greater integration of health promotion be it in terms of community uh, based services intergenerational work or indeed in terms of long-term residential and social care, incorporating a health promotion model, including a health promotion model of social care, uh, could really be quite, uh, you know, there's a lot of scope for development in that, but we have very few real examples of it. Uh, opportunistic health promotion within acute services, where of course time is quite limited and of the essence, but again we have initiatives like making every contact count so that questions are asked in the, in the course of a consultation regarding health promotion, because people at that time are very sensitised towards their health and there really is an opportunity to say, have you thought about, you know, your exercise diet, your smoking, your well-being, your stress, your goals? You know, um, and also then finally in that section we looked at the fact that education and training of health professionals needs to include health promotion in the undergraduate curriculum because you know if you don't learn about it there it's not going to really be important to you when you come into practice and there's actually been limited progress in that because those curriculum as you know they're stuffed full and it's very difficult to get um, some uh, extra hours in there but that's where it's the kind of pre-service training as well as the in-service education and training. Then we went to the area of primary care and Jan and his colleague Dion contributed to this. Uh, and here, of course, the whole notion of a comprehensive and integrated spectrum of primary care is not new. It was there from Alma Ata and has again been reinforced in the Astana Declaration. Um, and again, on universal health coverage, that notion that there is promotion and prevention alongside treatment and recovery. This is uh, the, the, the continuum. Uh, in that we looked at the how primary care is so well positioned to have a role in improving health literacy and this is moving beyond functional health literacy it's not just about patients being able to read prescriptions and, and follow instructions it's critical health literacy being able to appraise information being able to then apply that information in the context of their lives but it's also about the primary care and professionals uh, engaging in that process of making the organization more health literate, changing the way you interact. So here we looked at enhancing communication and shared decision making um, and uh, how important that is and making uh, services more accessible for people. So the health literacy has to go two ways. Um, also looked at health promotion interventions in primary care and while we have reasonably good um, uh, outcomes from brief interventions, when we look at lifestyle counselling and other issues, the actual uh, evidence is, is, is not good there actually, it's, it's weak in terms of the impact, particularly for people at lower risk. So it's saying that you know you need to move beyond that, you need to go and look at you know people's social and living environments and so therefore we broaden then to community oriented primary care and we got some lovely examples uh, from primary uh, healthcare practices here in Belgium uh, regarding that outreach into community resources so going so again it's going back to the socio-ecological approach where are people living their lives because that's where health is created and damaged and so it's linking back into that and also reaching out into more vulnerable members of, uh, uh, of the community um, and that, and so community uh, primary care is very well placed as the first point of contact, located within the social milieu of their client group. So it's really uh, in, in a very critical position to kind of do uh, do that kind of work. And we also reference some of the work around social prescribing. You know, the prescribing of non-medical sources of support and resources based on people's needs. 
Uh, and of course also then the importance of advocacy and the important role that primary care can play in terms of advocacy for health promotion within that community setting. Okay, um, also the integration, you know, we talked about the kind of trends in terms of public health and primary care within that concept of primary care zones working together more closely. And there clearly is an opportunity for health promotion also to be more integrated within that and with social care as well, so that you can see from a community perspective, it makes sense that these kind of work together in a more joined up fashion. Coming to sustainable financing, and here the health economists in the group contributed to our deliberations on this section. Um, it's clear that with health promotion, there are low levels of spending, um, despite evidence of cost effectiveness. And we look, there evidence is there on cost effectiveness, but that's obviously not enough to look at uh, uh, improved and sustained levels of, of uh, financing. It's less than 3% in most countries, the OECD tell us, but I would suggest it's less than 1% in a lot of countries, actually. Um, and the, here, the explanations for why this might be, of course, there is the issue of timing. When you invest in health promotion, there is a time lag because the effects can be more long term. And so there's a bias maybe in terms of having you know, closer and shorter term effects. There's also, I suppose, uncertainty that there's often a lack of clear and visible link between investment and outcome. So if you have programs in schools that, in, that, that lead to long term improved health in adulthood, that's, that's a causal pathway. You know, and so it's more difficult to see it. Now, that's not always the case. Sometimes in health promotion, there are proximal short term outcomes that we can monitor. But of course, making that more visible is actually quite important to the argument here. And pay payment mechanisms need to obviously then try to clearly identify what are the tangible benefits and the assets from health promotion, because the more tangible you make those, the more important they will be. And also, they also talked about the importance of creating a sense of entitlement. So if budgets and health promotion are cut, we are unlikely to see protests in the street. If you cut hospital beds, you will see that. So what are people losing? You know, so when we say, what are, you, what are you gaining from health promotion? And if you take away the funding, well, what are you losing? So that seems to be quite an important element to this, that there's a sense of real and tangible entitlement uh, around it. So establishing mechanisms to set the overall level of funding and very importantly, to protect that into the future. So these could be legal mechanisms, there can be laws, payment system itself builds it in, that they can be uh, reporting contracts, be that on a medium uh, uh, or short term, and then that they're very importantly, there's a sense of citizen entitlement. And we look then at different uh, sources of funding uh, and different innovative models of paying for health promotion. Uh, and there is the phenomenon of health promotion foundations, which are, of course, funded from taxes on tobacco and alcohol and other what are called the sin taxes in, in different countries around the world. Um, and while these work, the issue is, I suppose, the more successful you are, the, the lower your budget will become. <laughs> so so there, there is a bit of a problem <laughs> with that model. Um, and then there are the different, there's earmarked funding, delegated financing and budgeting schemes. But the, the issue seems to be what can you protect what protective mechanisms can you put in there to make the budget sustainable? So you've got to set the overall level and then look to protect that uh, into the future. And then we come to the section on mobilising community participant engagement, which our colleague uh, Luba, sitting at the back here, also contributed. And this recognises, of course, that we're talking about a whole of society approach here, engaging civil society organisations, non-state actors, particularly if we're looking at a cross-sectoral approach. This is really important that there's a wider community engagement um, and really important for policy development that's inclusive and implementation processes that are inclusive. Um, here, the focus here is on how people can be empowered to engage with this, yeah, and, and also empowered to demand action. I think that that's quite important. Uh, and working in partnership effectively, building trust, dialogue, uh, synergy uh, in terms of different agendas. So community development and asset-based approaches, uh, working with local uh, community structures. The issue of cultural competence, of course, is incredibly important here when we talk about community working, uh, the power sharing, uh, collaborative decision making and partnerships and working with bicultural workers if that's appropriate, because it, when we're engaging, you know, with, with diverse, diverse communities, that really has to be uh, um, on, on the agenda. 
a very important also around mobilising community participation is reaching out to those more vulnerable groups and also younger people, engaging younger people around, around health and health issues. So using diverse methods and of course new technologies to reach people uh, and there's a lot more that can be done in relation to this. So I think that was that brought us to our conclusions, so coming towards the end. And our conclusions are that there is a solid case for investing in health promotion, uh, be it on the grounds that it improves population health and well-being, that it reduces uh, inequities in health, it protects human rights, and also that it improves the performance of health system in terms of making them more sustainable. The implementation of the SDGs in Europe and the focus on universal health coverage I kids, gives a new impetus for concerted action around health promotion. I think it's time that we move beyond the rhetoric because the rhetoric isn't contested in many ways, but strengthening systems and capacities for implementation. So that's where we need to, it's the implementation and making it real. Integrating health promotion more effectively within our health systems in terms of strengthening the health promotion functions. And I think this needs to be done at the broader po political and policy level as advocated by a health and all policies approaches. So we need a comprehensive approach to this. There aren't quick fixes. I think we need, there needs to be a, a, a strategic commitment to it. So coming to the recommendations then. We uh, suggest that there's a need for advocacy for the importance of health promotion, promotion for sustainable health systems. So making sure that what health promotion is about is understood across the political spectrum and also in communications for public health. You, you know, to make that, give, give it more prominence and communicate this clearly and especially for vulnerable groups. Advancing political commitment for effective policies and action plans. Uh, and here, uh, looking at high-level policymakers, both at the EU level and at the country level, to take but just what is the what is the balance of spending across the spectrum of health services? Re reviewing that and balancing spending in terms of treatment and rehabilitation with promotion and prevention in a more realistic way. Investing in the development of robust policies and programs at EU level, so that we see kind of a sustained kind of investment in a comprehensive approach beyond once off and standalone uh, initiatives. Developing capacity to implement uh, at EU and member state level and here looking at guidelines and standards regarding governance structures and processes. What needs to be in place? You know, um, What level of leadership is necessary for this and political responsibility at the country level? Strategic leadership is very important uh, in terms of strengthening health, promoting health systems. And so making sure that it's integrated across European and national policies, not only in health, but in other social policies as well, because it can fit quite well uh, across that uh, sp spectrum. Providing technical guidance on implementation in practice because um, supporting countries around setting norms and standards for best practice and also priority interventions so that each country doesn't have to start at the beginning, as it were. Promoting the integration within health services, which we spoke about, and particularly primary care. We can see how important that is uh, because universal access to health promotion will increase the scope and reach of those services, uh, particularly for underserved groups. Supporting the assessment of health promotion capacity in member states, and this is where we can look and benchmark countries, like what um, you know policy and implementation structures are in place. So making it an assessment of that, what's missing, where are the gaps, what needs to be strengthened. The need to invest in a dedicated workforce. Again, we have uh, talked about that earlier. And I think there's important leadership at European level needed in recognition of the fact that we that, that a dedicated health promotion workforce that has the right set of skills and competencies for quality professional practice on this. I think that that's really important uh, for effective delivery. Investing in research, innovative interdisciplinary approaches and we've listed some of those. For example, monitoring positive indicators of population health and well-being at a country level. Not just monitoring our outcomes in terms of mortality and morbidity, but in terms of positive health and well-being. There can we see uh, the impact. 
comprehensive evaluation because many of our health promotion interventions are complex and they're multi-level and our existing methodologies are not well designed and well suited to cope with that complexity, be it you know whole, whole school approaches, whole workplace approaches. Multi-country implementation trials. We have you know, a real systematic focus on implementation research, taking it from the evidence into, and does it work across different uh, settings and contexts? Economic analysis of our health promotion intervention so that we can improve you know, the whole kind of uh, dialogue and debate around that. And dissemination of feasible evidence-based approaches that have been shown to work. Uh, critical to this also is knowledge translation mechanisms. Um, and that is, um, you know, I think many countries have invested in knowledge translation strategies and approaches, uh, Australia, uh, Canada in particular around public health, but maybe doing that at the European level. So we've more effective take up and use of research and knowledge and a better two way dialogue from practice, well, three way practice policy and research around this so that evidence is more usable and the wisdom from practice comes back into the evidence as well. So we need to look at dedicated uh, uh, centres for that. Strengthening our partnerships at EU level so that there is a kind of a, a, an active engagement of key players and actors, be that in terms of NGOs like IUHPE, Eurohealth Net, academic partners who are working in this space, and national focal points because getting that dialogue across countries so that there is learning going on and a sharing of experience and knowledge. And finally, supporting social mobilization strategies, improving the broad level of community engagement and how, how that engagement process is undertaken so that we can promote greater public awareness and understanding um, <coughs> and that there is an appreciation of what health promotion has to offer in terms of sustainable human, social and economic development. Why is it important? Uh, and greater accountability at EU and country level. So we've reached the end. <laughs> so thank you very much for listening. And I think we have time for comments, questions and answers. Thank you. Thank you very much, <laughs> uh, Margaret, for this uh, wonderful talk. I think everything that could ever be said about <laughs> health promotion uh, is in this document. Thank you so much. Uh, in the meantime, also uh, another member of our group arrived, which is uh, Muraskiene Ljuba uh, from Vilnius, and please join us here up front. And she mainly worked on the issue of the community aspect mm -hmm. in the document, as was already said by Margaret. And by the way, we also welcome from DG Sente, uh, Nicolin Tamsma, uh, Dumatrisku Ovidiu, and Volosinova Viera. So that's the team, and of course, our trainee as well. So the floor is now open for discussion. Uh, the idea is not uh, to say, well, uh, you are right or you are wrong, <laughs> but to give feedback on the content and to suggest uh, improvements, a broader uh, debate on the, the content can then be uh, given once we have the final draft uh, edited. So your feedback now comes to uh, help us to improve the document and to uh, deal with things that uh, are not well explained or uh, omissions and other kinds of things. As I said already, present yourself when you intervene. Speak into the microphone. This is a kind of family meeting, but nevertheless, we need a microphone because of our remote participants that have to be able to follow us. So uh, then comes the most difficult question of this morning. And who is going to make the first comment? Yes, please. Present yourself and... Hi, I'm Emma Woodford from the European Oncology Nursing Society. Stand up, please. Stand up? <laughs> yes, that's better. Um, yeah, well, thanks uh, for the opportunity to ask the question. Um, coming from the healthcare professional uh, perspective, uh, we very much like to see the better call for education and capabilities in the multidisciplinary teams and the fact that mm -hmm. Health throughout the document, healthcare workers are called healthcare professionals. I think that's uh, very much appreciated. Um, however, there are a lot of uh, prevention activities going on already, uh, especially amongst the oncology nursing community. We have members operative in hospitals, in communities, um, and also in primary 
care settings, working on tobacco control projects, working on giving advice to, to uh, people in communities on alcohol prevention programs. Um, so I think you know the phrase developing the capacity for healthcare professionals is a bit limited. I think we need to be looking at what is already out there, harnessing the experience of these healthcare professionals, identifying the change makers and using them to inspire others. Um, and I'll send some more detailed notes in a, in a written feedback. Thanks. Thank you very much for this uh, comment. Uh, you want to join on the same topic and then we reflect from here, or is it a new topic you oh, want it's to? It's a new topic. A new topic. Okay. So then yeah. maybe let's uh, have a short reflection uh, uh, on this. I think this is very worthwhile contribution. Yeah, thank you for, for, for yes. raising that. And yes, indeed, of course, there is a lot of prevention activities included within healthcare workers. I think that the, the point we are making here as well is that in addition, we also need to help prom see health promotion outside of the healthcare setting as well. It's really crucially important in community settings, schools, workplaces, homes. So there is a need also in terms of pr the promotion element as well as prevention, primary, secondary, tertiary prevention within healthcare. So we see it as a spectrum and all, all is needed. So I, I hope that clarifies. So we're saying we need the promotion as well as the prevention. And of course, there is key activities by health professionals that contribute to this and are really important to reinforce and to strengthen. I think thank you for the example yeah, yeah, uh, please. Professionals in communities yeah. Yeah. yeah, please do, please do. Yeah. We'll, be, we'll be very much welcome uh, because that makes it more yeah. concrete. And of course, we are very happy also that you mentioned the issue of education of health uh, professionals preparing them uh, for the future and uh, I just want to remind you that we published some months ago uh, a document an opinion on task shifting where we dealt in depth with the issue of education mm -hmm. profiles complementarity yeah. and this kind of issue and of course this applies uh, for sure also to the field of health promotion mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so thanks for reminding us mm -hmm. please next uh, intervention Microphone is coming. Yes, thank you. Um, my name is uh, Dorota Sienkiewicz and I work for EuroHealthNet, so one of the two organizations mentioned in the slide and uh, the opinion. So thank you very much, although I think it's a, a joint uh, um, uh, work done by <laughs> many organizations uh, across Europe. Um, uh, thank you very much for the uh, for the draft opinion that we've looked in, but we didn't manage to uh, go to the the end in the uh, in the space of time that uh, uh, between it was uh, published and and today. So we will also uh, uh, submit a, a written uh, response or contribution where we will try to uh, provide a kind of more detailed. Um, uh, account. Uh, just a couple of uh, things. Um, um, uh, if I could ask here for like better clarification or just to kind of add to the to the discussion, um, um, w we feel the the opinion is uh, a little bit too much maybe for the moment still um, uh, resting on the UN. So the very much WHO and UN approaches, so a kind of maybe a better link to the really like EU uh, policies and not only within the health uh, sector but also other policies that are there and really actually linking to the to the treaty on the functioning of the the EU, the Article 168. Mm. I mean, you, you've mentioned the health in all policies uh, approach uh, several times, but if if this could be even put uh, up front that there is a legal basis for that already and uh, so that it's more mm -hmm. better enforced yeah. etc um uh, other things that um we think could definitely add to the to the opinion is the uh, you talk about health literacy uh, um, as a way to uh, transform or deliver the, the health promoting health systems. Uh, the digital health literacy is very important as well, since we see the the pace of the digital transformation of, of health and society uh, in general. Um, I mean. Um, you, you mentioned linking the the fact to the uh, education sector, uh, so that other uh, other sectors take responsibility. Uh, a lot is happening already at the EU level uh, within, for example, the economy of well-being uh, approaches, mm -hmm. and the European semester, the implementation of the European pillar of social rights, mm -hmm. uh, the next EU budget. So 
we will try to provide a written contribution uh, in relation to that because a, a lot of uh, financial technical assistance mm -hmm. is already there that could help uh, uh, transit the health systems and, and other systems towards uh, being more health promoting. And another thing, sorry, the last thing, <laughs> just just to add, uh, EuroHealthMed has recently published a financing guide on, uh, it, it wasn't mentioned yet, yeah. I think, because it was a kind of coinciding around the same time. Yeah. So uh, a, a lot of things uh, and ideas mm -hmm. also there on innovative ways uh, and mechanisms to, to search uh, for uh, financing yeah. uh, to add. Yeah, thank you. Great. Thank you very much, um, Margaret, yeah. please. I, yeah, I'm aware of the financing guide. It came out just as we were nearing the end of the report. So there's an opportunity to reference it uh, in, in the final version. And I would welcome your inputs on the issues that you mentioned and, and as soon as you can, because we need to complete this report within the next couple of weeks, I think. So yes, uh, the panel will decide uh, upon the final version in its meeting on the 7th of November, November which so is, of course, nearby. So uh, it would be great to have your input on that. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you also for the mentioning the issue of dig digital health literacy. Yes, I right. just want to remind you that we recently published yeah. a opinion, an opinion on uh, digitalization right, yeah. where this issue was mentioned. But I think uh, we should cross we should reference this issue. also uh, mm. to this uh, text. It's mentioned briefly, it's mentioned but it's briefly, not. Yes. Yes. We can we can strengthen that reference. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And, and of course, stimulating us to have a kind of integrated vision, taking elements from EU policies, UN, WHO approaches, I think, uh, is, is absolutely in the DNA of this uh, of this uh, uh, panel. And it, it's it, I think uh, you, you very correctly mentioned the opportunities to improve that aspect mm -hmm. clearly. Okay. okay. Other reflections, questions, please present yourself and take the floor. Thank you very much. My name is Martina Gleber. I work at Institut Marieu. It's a, a health industry company based in France. I have a background in health promotion and health management mm -hmm. <laughs> from a German university in Magdeburg. And I'm also finalizing a training in sophrology that is a body-brain intervention psychocorporal um, approach for uh, stress reduction. So I wanted to make uh, three points. So the first one is health literacy. We think that this is really important to uh, better inform and with a global approach, not only a few uh, happy ones, but really access to all about a healthy lifestyle and impact uh, on diseases. Uh, share evidence really broadly, also with maybe disadvantaged population inform also about the impact, uh, for example, of uh, inappropriate antibiotic intake. Uh, the issue about uh, antimicrobial resistance is very important and there are so many people that are still not aware about the inappropriate intake of antibiotics. The second one is healthy food and the environmental approach and the policy around that. I think we will more and more move towards a kind of a personalized nutrition approach and integrate all these healthy food aspects also in not only in health promotion prevention, but also from a treatment approach. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I think this is uh, health promoting activities, I think certainly uh, are focused on healthy population, but I think our health promoting activities should go more and more also into, uh, into the health care mm -hmm. domain and uh, help the people to get again <laughs> improved health and not only to stay healthy think that this is important. And the third uh, one is around stress. Mm -hmm. You mentioned uh, the chapter about uh, mental well-being, mm -hmm. and I think this is really important. Mm -hmm. And we have not uh, enough shown the evidence about stress on diseases, on chronic diseases, but also infectious diseases, and what to do in order to help people individually to reduce the stress. And I, I do not only say that because <laughs> I'm trained in this kind of body-brain interventions, but we are trying it now uh, at the workplace. Our company had sev has 17,000 employees all over the world, and we try to, to help them really to, to, uh, to provide these approaches uh, with health-promoting activities mm -hmm. at the workplace. Mm -hmm. And there are very 
positive uh, impacts now already uh, and the people really say that they need to get um, help in managing their stress, their emotions. And it's a kind of a, yeah, individual empowerment uh, to stay healthy, but really also to manage pain. Uh, the stress component mm -hmm. and anxiety regarding to pain is very important. So I think all around stress um, is uh, maybe something you could highlight a little bit more within the chapter of mental well-being. And then I would also say that there could be a little bit more link to the European instruments and initiatives, uh, especially the importance about evidence generation and make me maybe there a link to Horizon Europe that is currently being prepared, the new framework program for health and innovation of the European uh, Union. Mm -hmm. So inside there, there are uh, health partnerships uh, where may we would like, at least uh, with FPR, COSIR, we are discussing future health partnership and we think there is a room for including health promotion more and more together with uh, a health uh, more medical approach but to have a cross-cutting approach. There are the missions on soil health when we talk about nutrition. There is a mission about soil health and food. There is a mission about cancer where I think health promotion should be more included and also in other work programs of Horizon Europe. And then we have the health program from DJ Sante, where uh, there could be in, uh, initiatives like joint actions, um, joint action on health promotion. I, I'm not sure if that exists already, but I think recommendations on these kind of initiatives could be interesting in your report. And maybe also the European Investment Bank. I don't know if there could be some incentives for uh, companies in order to provide health promoting activities at the workplace. Um, yeah, I think it's a lot around incentives. It's also a lot around reimbursement. These kind of activities for the moment are not yet reimbursed, even if they can have a huge impact. So probably we, we need to first show the impact they can provide and then uh, work towards um, new models of, of reinforcement. I think this is really important. And all that in an integrated cross-cutting approach. So really try to integrate health promotion also into the whole care pathway and uh, maybe demonstrate also better treatment outcomes. Thank you. Thank you for uh, this uh, contribution um, that mainly uh, helps us to become more precise in illustrating the principles and the concepts that are put forward in the opinion market you have to i think uh, most of those things are uh, that you mentioned are straightforward and yeah. are worthwhile mentioning yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, and in relation to the stress in the workplace, I mean, there are, th I mean, there's quite a bit of evidence uh, already there, but particularly around not just individual, you know, improved stress management, but also around whole organisational approaches, and it's when you get those individual and organisational approaches working together, and of course, the health and safety directive includes that whole issue of psychosocial hazards in the workplace. And how important that is, so that there is a there is a uh, you know a, a, a growing evidence base around wh what makes that work. Yeah. Okay. Yes, I see a lot of uh, reactions uh, all over the place. <laughs> uh, maybe we start there, and then we go that way, and then uh, <laughs> yes, please. Present yourself. Uh, stand up and speak clearly. Thank you. Uh, my, I, my name is uh, Maura Lusignani. I am an associate professor in nursing sciences at the University of Milan, and uh, I represent the Italian National Federation of Nurses. Uh, we appreciated in uh, your document uh, uh, many important key points. Uh, first, the need for a um, health conceptual framework, including the, the sustainable development goal, this is a very important content for education and practice, of course. The progress that have been made in the application in practice of this new approach, the evidence that showed the efficacy of health promotion, and uh, the need for both advocacy and uh, political action and uh, sustainable financing for health promotion, considering the lack of investment in developing the necessary health promotion system. Moreover, we agreed when you said foster health, promoting health system calls for
for a new base of multidisciplinary knowledge, skill, competencies that extend beyond the traditional healthcare approach. This requires a broader understanding, you said, of health and its determinants, yes, mm -hmm. of course, and an advanced recognition of a dedicated at, prof at promotion workforce. You said and uh, we agreed that a cadre of uh, health promotion specialists are required with the necessary training and uh, competencies to implement effective programs and policies and work with the wider workforce to ensure sustainable action. These challenges imply both the organizational and workforce capacity development, you said, and the academic capacity to meet the new population needs. In the document, however, despite the agreeable premises and analysis, unfortunately, uh, we didn't find a line dedicated to the importance of the nurse's role in health promotion. And in this case, we are talking about, in the EU, almost 4 million nurses, and in Italy, 400,000 nurses. You dedicate a paragraph, of course, for health promotion, education, and training for health professional, <laughs> but referred only to medical mm -hmm, education. Mm -hmm. We would have liked you to have mentioned the role of nurses in health promotion. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, we think, of course, that nurses play a critical role in providing uh, health care, not only in hospital and uh, uh, long-term care institutions, but uh, uh, increasingly also in primary care and uh, in home care setting, for which there is robust evidence as to their impact in improving health outcomes in multiple domains. As we said, a growing number of nurses also work in primary care in many countries in response to the two shortages of general practitioners. Some country, countries have introduced uh, or extended advanced role for nurses to improve access to primary care. Evaluation of this experience with advanced nurse practitioner in country like Finland and the United Kingdom indicate that these nurses can improve access to care and reduce waiting times while providing the same quality of care as doctor for a range of patients, for example, with uh, uh, those with minor illnesses or requiring routine follow-up. Uh, the impact of nurse-led clinics in relation to, the, to patient outcome, patient satisfaction, impact on patient access to services and cost effectiveness has been demonstrated in the literature. The most important outcome found were, for example, patient self-reported improved symptom management or health, feeling of improved general health, health of and well-being, and specific improvement in chronic obstructive pulmonary disease symptoms and in the healing time of ulcers, improved body mass index standard deviation score in obese children, and treatment regime for upper respiratory tract infection or in the improvement of medication adherence. Of course, there are examples, only examples. Advanced practice nursing, nurses in this situation were integrated, of course, with multidisciplinary teams and uh, the main intervention deployed were patient education, multidimensional assessment, and coordination for multiple providers. In the EU and also in our country, a core curriculum for postgraduate level training in health promotion based on core competencies has been implemented, but further investment is required in this field. Finally, in your conclusion and recommendation, you confirm what we have been saying. We need more investment both in academic education and in practice to develop dedicated work, workforce for health promotion in Europe, ensuring they have the necessary knowledge, skills, competencies to strengthen their role in the health system and promote their professional identity and responsibility. And we agree with this conclusion and ask for the mention of the role of nurses in health promotion and for the improvement of advanced nursing education at the master degree level, for example, in the, the family and community nurse or in the nurse in public, uh, in public health or in other specialistic uh, sector. Thank you for your kind attention and I hope this hearing has been useful for you. Thank you.
Thank you very much uh, for uh, the making this point. Um, we uh, have clearly seen uh, that uh, some of the dimensions nurses contribute to um, are, from your point of view, not sufficiently explicit mm -hmm. in the document, and we will look uh, to see how we can do that. However, that have been said, the approach from the panel has always been uh, the emphasis on an interprofessional, inter inter integrated approach by a team, be it at primary care level, be it in hospital level, be it in public health mm -hmm. uh, approaches. And that's also what we emphasized in a, a lot of our other uh, opinions that we made. And of course, uh, quantitatively and qualitatively, nurses play an important role uh, in, in at all these levels um, and uh, have a diversified uh, appearance nowadays uh, with people that are doing independent consultations that are involved in specific disease-oriented programs or that grassroots working in strengthening uh, the difficult-to-reach groups and informing them about uh, health and related issues. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so the point has been clearly taken and uh, we appreciate, of course, the appreciation that you uh, clearly echoed in your intervention towards the work we have done. Thanks for that. The next speaker, also somebody from our fan club. Well, we welcome. Good morning and uh, thank you very much for organizing uh, this hearing and uh, for the comprehensive presentation. Uh, my name is Antonio Gazzo from the PTU, the Community Pharmacist uh, uh, Organization at European level. We represent community pharmacists from 32 European countries. Uh, so, of course, we welcome very much the, your presentation and the content of the paper, uh, referencing to the important services of healthcare professionals in general uh, as uh, being helpful in promoting health in communities. And we also welcome your recommendation, also quoting the uh, OECD uh, finding that only 3% uh, of uh, healthcare budget is invested in uh, health promotions, which is uh, uh, um, something that is circulating around from the State of Health in the EU initiative since a couple of years ago. But we still find that uh, there has not been a much improvement in terms of managing finances uh, at member state level and increasing the, the uh, share of uh, investments in promotion. So we join you in advocating for increasing uh, resources in this field. Uh, and of course, when it comes to uh, promoting health, to uh, reducing uh, uh, health inequalities, to improving uh, the, the gap that exists between uh, people with different social backgrounds, uh, in accessing uh, healthcare services, community pharmacies play a key role uh, in Europe because we are the most accessible point of healthcare systems uh, across uh, uh, Europe. We are present, uh, we are uh, often the only healthcare facility present in rural areas uh, in, in Europe where most likely vulnerable groups uh, are uh, resident. Uh, and therefore, we provide health services that promote health and uh, that are increasingly going beyond the poor medicine supply, uh, but uh, include also early screening of uh, diseases and uh, immunization services, uh, as well as uh, contributes to improving health literacy uh, in patients since we provide free advice on uptake of medication and more specific services um, around uh, medicine news review and uh, uptake of new medicines by the patients. Um, we also welcome your call to uh, uh, increase uh, funding for health uh, promotion uh, research because we uh, have uh, our services have been uh, evaluated at economic level uh, from uh, an academic point of view and they have been proven to be cost effective mm -hmm. and also uh, um, improving clinical outcome in patients. Uh, and therefore, we, we promote if uh, this uh, is, is uptaken 
uh, by, uh, by institution when uh, uh, doing their recommendation to the member states. We would also welcome to uh, include and, and link the, the uh, call for uh, help, uh, increasing investments in health promotion to some key European initiatives such as the European Semester, uh, where member states um, are often confronted with budget uh, uh, pressure, uh, with, with measures and recommendations related to budget pressure, but we should not forget that uh, ad promotion can be something that will bring uh, 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 also benefit in terms of public finances uh, in the future. Uh, and uh, then, uh, last but not least, we would welcome, uh, if possible, the reference to, to also community pharmacy services in your paper within uh, with the framework that we understand very well of an integrated care approach and that we also support. And in that respect, we would welcome the possibility to send you some written uh, comments and references to our paper. Thank you. Thank you very much um, uh, for sharing a lot of the aims and goals that are formulated mm -hmm. in this document and also for putting our attention on the need that this requires translation into European instruments. Mm -hmm, I think mm -hmm. that's an important mm -hmm. issue that mm -hmm. comes up and of course supporting the, the, the teamwork approach where the role of the community pharmacists, as you explained clearly, becomes increasingly important and in many countries we really see a shift in the profile of the community pharmacists mm -hmm. from just dispensing medication to become a health agent mm -hmm. uh, in the society, what you also mentioned very clearly. So I think that that is uh, very valuable mm -hmm. um, and it illustrates the importance of this document to be translated into the perspectives and the practice of different uh, disciplines mm -hmm. in the framework of our interprofessional yeah. approach. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Next intervention. Yes, please present yourself. And yes. My name is uh, Wouter Arazola Dioniati. I'm a medical doctor in public health. And now working for the Belgian Lung and Tuberculosis Association, so air pollution, tobacco, and tuberculosis. Uh, from the tuberculosis uh, sector, I would like to say, of course, that it, it's one of the diseases that m strongly linked with social determinants. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. go and talk with the tuberculosis associations because they have a lot of experience. We have been working for 110 years here in Brussels with um, outreach, with um, community health uh, involvement, uh, with culture sensitive um, ways of working. That's one. Um, Professor, you mentioned uh, indeed vested interests. And I would suggest to elaborate a little bit more on the commercial determinants of mm -hmm. health and the inappropriate interference of industries with mm -hmm. conflicts of interest into policy making mm -hmm. using um, fake science, lies, yeah. lobbying, uh, yeah. lying scientists. Mm -hmm. um, because we have a health promotion, we can have a health promotion sector that's really strong. If we don't handle the commercial determinants, mm -hmm. we're not going to reach as far as we wish. So how to deal with the power imbalance mm -hmm. between them? Mm -hmm extremely rich and powerful uh, corporations and health policies. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Thank you very much for this point. And I think uh, the word commercial determinants r came up in our discussions yeah. uh, when we discussed this document yeah. very clearly. We have, we have included a section on addressing the commercial determinants and spoke a little bit about the nature of that in, in terms of the interference. We have, a, a, we have strengthened a, a paragraph on, on that. Um, and you talk about the power Im the power imbalance as well. And I mean, clearly, what we can see from tobacco is where you have where you assert the right of countries to protect the health of their population, and you put a legal framework around it. Mm -hmm. I mean, this is obviously the ideal. I mean, that's how we sh shifted. The, the 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 debate on smoking and moved it along, uh, and clearly, if you have a kind of legal and regulatory framework from the top, that strengths as well as a support that people want it, uh, and that's and so now that has to be done across the diverse commercial 
uh, determinants that are there. So I mean, I think that that process there's an awareness of that, and it's starting to to to, to be addressed uh, through a and, and again, it's worth saying that the WHO framework on tobacco control was very much up and down the Ottawa Charter. It used integrated actions, and I think this is uh, this to me seems that what we have to to do across these areas, maybe in terms of unhealthy products and their marketing. Yeah. yeah. And, and also when it comes to, well, uh, fake information, yeah. um, we dealt with it, especially in our uh, the opinion on vaccination. Mm -hmm. And yeah. that is a, an important chapter on <laughs> vaccination hesitance right. and the different components. And, and it, it is uh, true, uh, and media increasingly pay attention to this, that we don't have only to promote the good things, but that more and more you also have to make sure that there are not uh, disinformation sure. strategies yeah. that reach people yeah. uh, and that are dominated uh, by all kinds of interests that are not really the health of the people and the individuals. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. uh, yeah. and that's the that's the playing field we are yeah. in today. And I think we have to look very carefully at who is sponsoring and supporting work in different areas. Who, who are they? Because <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> it's not it's not always immediately yeah. clear. Yes. <laughs> And that's why yeah. the yeah. conflicts yeah. of yeah. interests of all the yeah. panel members are on the website. <laughs> you can see uh, yeah. what we are uh, all doing in different fields. Mm -hmm. Good. Uh, this transparency, I think, is absolutely required because it's a precondition to have an open debate. Uh, exactly. Mm -hmm. And and of course, power imbalance is also an important mm -hmm. issue th that you mentioned. And thanks for reminding us that there is still tuberculosis as an indicator that we mm -hmm. still did not achieve our Tuber goals when it comes to social right, determinants yeah. of health. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's right. yeah, after more than a century. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, the next intervention, please. Yes, please. Yeah. Thank you very much. Uh, my name is Thomas Alvin uh, from FBR, the European Federation of Pharmaceutical Industries and Associations, uh, representing the uh, research-based pharmaceutical industry in, in Europe. Uh, thank you very much for, for, for this report and, and, and for this, this uh, opportunity to, to comment. Uh, and I think that, that, and it was reflected by some earlier comments, I think, you know, with the developments in, in science and digital health, etc., cetera, I, I think we see more and more the, the old boundaries between sort of prevention and treatment, etc., is starting to blur and, and becoming more of a continuum which I think is 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 very exciting uh, with uh, a, a lot of uh, opportunities uh, there uh, just uh, three three main points really the first being on on budgets and financing uh, which I think is really important and 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 you mentioned in the report this this three percent figure mm -hmm. from the OECD mm -hmm. and and <clears throat> but which of course is 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 related to sort of classic public health and prevention but I think also if we look at, if we see health pr promotion as you do in the report in the broader perspective of health in all policies, and you start to look at what's, what's the, the role of other sectors, uh, transport, clean cities, mm -hmm. you know, environment, housing, all these things, then you potentially get a lot more budget to play with if you can make these sectors mm -hmm. work for mm -hmm. health. And mm -hmm. I think that's also mm -hmm. something, you know, uh, us in the health sector should think about more how to how to look beyond and and actually use those yeah. uh, those instruments uh, to achieve uh, health health goals, and 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 also looking just within the the the, the health system and you mentioned the, the sort of the balance of spending, I think it again illustrates a, a wider issue also in more classic healthcare when when you have the different budgets. Uh, in healthcare, that d doesn't always work in towards joint a joint goal, and and if we take something just simple like I mean we all know that that more in, uh, you know investment in primary care to manage chronic diseases will avoid unnecessary spending in hospitalization mm -hmm. and emergency mm -hmm. care, but still when these are different budgets, mm -hmm. it's very difficult, difficult to to, mm -hmm. to get that investment yeah. to happen, and I think yeah. maybe some some good uh, good practices in this area from different countries would be interesting. Yeah to to highlight uh, the second point is more on on kind of personal empowerment and and i think going back to the comment earlier on 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 digital health literacy where, where i think there's so much happening when it comes to 
uh, things like well, uh, personal health apps, wellness apps, all these things. There's a there's an explosion in this mm. uh, this area, empowering people to kind of take control over their own own he own health. So some of this uh, might be very good. We don't know everything that's out there. Of course, is 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 very much b b bottom up rather than mm. top down in many mm. cases. But uh, but I think this is interesting to explore and maybe elaborate uh, a bit a bit more on and i and i think one important point there that that i think could be highlighted is 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 the uh, sort of uh, the right for the well not only the patient but the citizen to to access his or own uh, own health data and electronic mm -hmm. health records mm -hmm. as a way mm -hmm. to 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 getting uh, you know Mm -hmm. Getting that 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 empowerment uh, over over one's one's own uh, own health, and I think also you mentioned the role of social media when it comes to to young people. I think today it's not only young people. I I'm on social media. I'm I'm not that young anymore, unfortunately. So <laughs> so, 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 so I think this is a huge future perspective that I think it really needs to be to be highlighted. And then just on a fo uh, final point. And uh, some people already mentioned, you know, how to tie it to existing EU instruments, which I think is a good, good idea. And I think al also, you know, there's there's quite a few recommendations mm -hmm. in the report. And of course, there's always a risk when you have a long list of recommendations that none of them gets done. So, mm -hmm. so, uh, so, so maybe if you thought about, I don't know, structuring them or prioritizing, and and also think about, you know, what can the EU do. Versus the member states and 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 where can the European Union add add value through through different actions and and and, and instruments? Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much for mentioning these uh, important uh, points, uh, and already you, you gave clearly mm -hmm. indications to which of uh, the components of the opinion they speak to, uh, and also re-emphasizing the importance of stressing more explicitly what EU instruments uh, can do uh, in that field. Uh, in that respect also I invite you to have a look at the um, brainstorming paper that we published on our website in April, was not an opinion, and where some brainstorming ideas came up uh, from the panel members to inspire future developments. And just because you mentioned this, this balance of spending when countries want to move from uh, hospital-based care to primary care. Of course, conference countries and member states with the difficulty that you at a certain moment in time, you need to double financing because you still have your hospital and you have to strengthen your primary care. One of the suggestions the panel made was that could typically be something where Europe could help member states in uh, providing this transition within a framework of clearly set goals, uh, because otherwise you see that that countries and member states don't take the hurdle, because it's too difficult uh, in these days to say, well, let's go for a double spending, if the single spending becomes even problematic in many countries, as I see in the budget discussions in member mem members, mm -hmm. in a lot of member states today, when it comes to health. Yes, please. Can you speak? Oh, okay. okay, thank you. Coming back to this third percent, three percent, uh, the difficulties to calculate uh, money for the broader approach reveals the problem that there is a lack of systematic approach. Uh, so it is it's just uh, you couldn't cal easily calculate money for something not very well defined. Mm -hmm. It's a point as well. Yeah, <laughs> yeah that, that, that's of course, that's the problem with intersectoral action is mm -hmm. that you have this kind of, well, also intersectoral budgets, and most of the budgets in most of the countries are siloed. It's yes. either uh, traffic or housing or health. And with this approach, as we mm -hmm. mentioned very clearly and Margaret illustrated, you go transsectorally and then, as uh, Yuba said, it's very difficult to identify budgets, but at least making uh, being aware of these mechanisms is a first step to uh, make them much more clear and to emphasize them also mm -hmm. so thanks for this suggestion clearly other interventions please this has already been a highly participatory what do you want to have a short intervention yeah um, maybe a good 
I don't know the I don't know the diplomatic uh, sensitivities, but maybe good partners could be the the new uh, uh, director, uh, regional director of WHO Europe, Hans Kluge, who is also very interested in health services and changes to the health services systems. And of course, mm -hmm. all our hopes are in the <laughs> new commissioner, which is uh, Stella Kiriakides for health, and has a background I think that uh, mm -hmm. is very promising. And not at least also in the new president, uh, Ursula von der Leyen, who is a public health physician mm -hmm. uh, uh, by training. So um, we hope in the future that there will be opportunities and at least there are some mm -hmm. interesting uh, and very uh, inspiring indicators that may create opportunities for the future. Okay. So I think that I can say on behalf of all of us uh, that we are very grateful for this input. Mm -hmm. This is really helpful. Uh, if you want to send in some documents, mm -hmm. um, please do it as soon as possible because we are in a process. As you know, we end our second cycle and then on the 8th of November, our existence as a panel uh, ends. Uh, we, by the way, we have a symposium then. Uh, so then there will be a new panel that will start, I think, in the beginning of next year. Uh, so that means that we have to finalize this document in our plenary meeting of the 7th of November. So send it as soon as possible, uh, be as concise as possible. But already, I think, from this hearing, we have a clear idea on what are the points that require some mm -hmm. reflection, but we also appreciate very much the overall uh, positive feedback mm -hmm. that came from all the interventions. Yes. So this is very encouraging uh, for the work. I give the final floor to, to Margaret to mm. wrap up a few things. And Thank you, Jan. Just very briefly, just to thank you all very much for your engagement. I've made notes on the comments yeah. that were made. We'll take these away and uh, deliberate on them. And as Jan said, any further input gratefully received as soon as possible. So thank you very much indeed. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.